just tell us a little bit about, let's just start, start with the basics and we'll get into the, the techie stuff. Can we get into, uh, how did you get hooked up into road and how'd you get into audio and tell us your entire life story in a very brief, but beautiful arc. I will do my best. Right. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we hit it off so much at voiceover Atlanta and, uh, Hindenburg is just great for this kind of space that 32 bit float space, especially, and, uh, for our voiceover people and otherwise, but as far as me, uh, I've been doing this. Uh, I've been doing audio since, you know, I, I caught the bug back in high school doing things for theater and otherwise. But um, I, I met the right people at the right time and worked as a live sound engineer for three and a half years at Kemper Arena in Kansas City, where I'm from. And uh, that was just one of those situations. I always joked that I, you know, I, I knew the right people. Then I was good enough to not get fired afterwards. You know, that kind of situation. <laughs> and funny enough, in audio, that's kind of how it works a lot of times. But I've yeah. been doing it for uh, quite a while. Every year, I can't believe I've done it for as long as I've done it. And um, I, I, a very long story short on my path to kind of get here to road. I've, I've jumped between three states, Kansas City, where I'm from. I went to school in Arizona at a place called the Conservatory Recording Arts and Sciences after that arena job. I uh, just needed that piece of paper. And that had an internship, went to LA, uh, moved back to Arizona, worked for that school for a little while, educating and, uh, and uh, helping at the school. And then back to Kansas City, ran a company, a live sound company for a little while. On and on and on. Uh, but I got a call from my old colleague out in LA, and it, he is Jesse Dean, who's now our uh, uh, director of business development here in the in the States. And so he gave me a call and said, hey, do you want to travel about microphones? And I said, I absolutely do. You know, at the time, I was single and and wanted to always travel for, for audio. And so I've been doing it for nine years now for Rode, and it's been a heck of a ride. All right. Well, great. Tell us a little bit about Rode, because some folks may not know much about the company. So maybe just tell us a little bit about, of course, where it's from, yeah. uh, itself, but then maybe like the ethic, kind of the approach of Rode and all that kind of stuff. Wonderful. It sounds like you also have had some of the uh, information, I, whether I shared it with you at voiceover or otherwise. But yeah, Rode is Sydney, Australia based. And you said a very important thing, the ethics of it all. Rode has had the dream of making everything in house since it began. And so when you're starting a company and all these are kind of like stories, you know, glory day stories and so forth. Peter Friedman is the creator of Rode microphones. His father was making amplifiers, speakers and all kinds of stuff like that. So they had Friedman electronics uh, along with that. And that still exists today. But Peter wanted to do that uh, the same way, but with microphones. And so he created his first microphones back in the uh, early 90s, I think officially like the business was off and running in 94 that was kind of the first perfect like full on like here we're doing this real i think he created the nt1 original in uh, 90 and then 94 was kind of like hit the ground running uh, in 2000 we created the video mic series which has been a staple in our line forever and along the successes of growing that company they then buy the machines we now have i think and i could be wrong on this because they're updating every single day i think four um you know, surface mount technology machines and they have plastic molding. They're playing around with 3D printing, which I thought was hilarious last time I was there. Not because of anything wrong with it. It's just, and they said this too, it's just a technology that's growing. You know, it's a very consumer based thing at the moment, but for whatever you can do to learn things in manufacturing, but do it at home, you can't go wrong with that. So we're keeping that distribution channel as low as possible where the sharing of the, uh, the manufacturing costs and things like that are reduced significantly. So we can give you a high quality product at a low price. Okay. So, uh, in the nineties, you know, uh, they wasn't, they weren't podcasters because that wasn't a thing. Right. Unless he was really, really ahead of the game, which maybe somebody was, but, uh, that just wasn't a thing. So maybe, so a lot of our, um, our folks, our users, um, are familiar with road. Some are familiar with road microphones, but, um, many are familiar with uh, another side of it, which is the interface side. And, uh, you know, that is probably with the roadcaster, right? Either one or two or any of that kind of stuff. So can you tell us a little bit about, I worked it for a podcast uh, years ago where that was what we used at the time. And the, the reason was because we could take it around with us and do uh, remote recordings and that kind of stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? And I'm just full disclosure, I'm going through one right now I'm using a roadcaster and I can prove it because we uh one of the fun features of the roadcaster is you have all these buttons that you can assign effects for and you can make your voice like this and you can do this and do all kinds of really silly things that you can do. Okay. 
I'm on the same thing right now. <laughs> Those are obviously the best uh, features. And if you were or are still a Roadcaster Pro One user, Road uh, was very public about the the uh, the the idea of us creating a Roadcaster. Um, well, let me back up just a little bit, right? So the yeah. the concept, funny enough, like we were selling a la carte products as a microphone company would do, right? We were uh, creating some accessories, but for the most part, we were very much a microphone company. <clears throat> Pardon me. We uh, came out with the AI One uh, Audio Interface One. Uh, it's a one hundred thirty dollars, one hundred twenty nine dollars US um, uh, single channel interface, and then we bundled that with an NT One and all this stuff. Well, trying to bundle that into a podcast setup once podcast was just booming. Uh, that's hard to do and it gets pricier and pricier and pricier. So I actually did talk to uh, Australia myself just directly saying, what do you suggest? What do you recommend? How do you do this? And they said, just hang tight. We're, we got something for you. Can't tell you anything about it yet, but we got some for you. <clears throat> Six months later, the Roadcaster Pro 1 dropped and I'm like, well, that's not what I expected. <laughs> you know, being in the US, I'm clearly not a part of the uh, R&D, the, the product development and the, the growth of the building, all that stuff that's happening behind the scenes. Totally wish I was not Australian, um, but love, love geeking out about it so much with uh, everybody over in Australia as well. So they came out with the Rochester Pro One as an all in one sort uh, solution. Right, you got your pads, you have your faders, you have microphone inputs. So if you're a Rochester Pro One user, well, we were the first to do that. And we understood that the industry, well, actually, we didn't understand just to the extent in which the industry was going to take to it and then want growth from it. And that was amazing to watch. It was also a little bit, you know, difficult because you basically created this entire thing from scratch, put all these things together, and then also had to amend it almost weekly. <laughs> and so Road did an amazing job doing that. But there were physical things that you just couldn't add back in after the case, enter the Roadcaster Pro 2. So combo jacks, a heck of a lot of uh, onboard storage processing. Processing is number one. So we tried the reverb, we tried the echo, we tried those sound effects. It just didn't have the processing for it. The things you learn when you create the original device, right? And uh, so they just ramped it up exponentially on the Roadcaster Pro 2, four gigs of internal hard drive, um, a quad core processor, combo jacks, like I said, the preamps, you can't talk enough about the preamps, which if, as we get into 32 bit float, we will definitely be talking about the preamps, right? But yeah, we just had to give it space for processing to actually be able to do the job. And that's where the two came into play. And one of my biggest things that I respect them on is the cost. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, just that, like what you said about the, the processor processor. So it's basically like you have a computer built into your interface. 100 percent yeah. yeah and that's and and it's not the computer and i know you already know this i know everybody listening right now uh likely knows We're this not. as well we have, we have a, a wide range of folks oh fair enough it, it doesn't act as a computer uh and that's where you got to learn and read its um user guide to kind of get the idea of at what point is it actually acting as a computer and what point is it just absolutely not you know i do know devices that are actually plugged in um you know, to be coded and programmed and all that stuff. This is not that, but you essentially created the processing power of a computer inside of the Rodecaster Pro 2. So I do have a lot of conversations about its potential capabilities. And man, uh, as far as hardware, like what you can do uh, physically, that's probably, you know, that's why we max it out so much. But then with firmware after that, you can really customize it and change it. But they have to do that, right? It's not something uh, that's, uh, programmed from a computer side on your side, but right. um, with two USB ports and three IOs on it, you have a lot of flexibility. And to drive home what we were talking about with some of the tech issues, you know, we were we were getting AirMeet going, and then also deciding which inputs and outputs of my Rodecaster Pro and your Rodecaster Pro Two, but sorry, both are Rodecaster Pro Twos uh, to use in and out. So on some videos that we might share. I put it to another IO so that it didn't have to fight with my dialogue. So I have a video over here and I have dialogue over here and you can do that with a Roadcaster Pro 2. Right. Okay. So just endlessly customizable. You can say, go this part. I want to go here. That part. I want to go there. So what used to be back in the day um, of, you know, radio where you'd have a mixing console where they had all those inputs and outputs. Now that is all kind of contained in a, a very easy space with a lot of, you know, like I said, you know, computer processing power too. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that is a good, good way to, to, to transition to, um, 
this really exciting thing. So at uh, VoiceOver Atlanta, um, which for those folks who don't know, that's a um, a conference that features a lot of, uh, well, voiceover people and voiceover, uh, everything related to voiceover. So, you know, audiobooks, video games, movies, scripts, commercials, e-learning, all people doing those types of things. And some of you, I'm sure, are, are those people yourselves. Um, but we were, uh, Ryan was showcasing um, something that's come up a lot, and we have a lot of users asking us about it, and and that is this this 32 bit float. And there are some misconceptions about it. There are some. I have to be honest. I have changed my mind on it personally. I used to think that's very cool that you know we've developed this, but it doesn't really have a lot of technical utility because or practical utility. The reason being it allows you to have this huge dynamic range. So, but that's great, but why would you need to record a bus and a whisper at the same time? That sort of thing. However, especially in voiceover, but in countless things, the utility was really clear to me because you essentially can have uh, a performance where you can go from one part to the next to the next, and you could scream and yell as an animated character and then get very, very quiet and never have to touch your input game and it's essentially impossible to clip. So that utility, I recognize right away. That's that's really you know huge. So can you tell us, Ryan? Maybe, and uh, I think you have a, a, a presentation that that kind of demystifies some of this stuff, which is what we love at Hindenburg. Uh, absolutely. You know, you touched on some of the key factors. So I'd like to just right here with you talk yeah. about those applications, which. When, when I started talking about this, but well, when I started dreaming about it as an audio engineer, right? Uh, first and foremost, I just love the science behind it. I do get well, it gets well above my, you know, my scope uh, when you start talking about the algorithms that actually create that headroom mathematically in a digital space. It's just unbelievable the combination that uh, you can create with 32-bit float. But as an engineer, I just cared about one thing. And uh, if I'm recording an artist, uh, let's talk music. I always like to go for vocals. Well, those are usually very dynamic. You got a verse that's incredibly like emotional and uh, close proximity and this uh, just uh, romantic, like romantic something or other, you know, like think about all the verses, right? Like they usually come down. They're usually like dynamically lower. And then you got these choruses, which are dynamically big and you back off the microphone, you scream louder, you uh, just way more energy. That's the climax of a lot of this. Uh, music that we're doing well you'd have to set everything all the way across the board so not only did it create a bit of an unnatural effect and one of the art the artistic parts of it was creating uh, a natural transition between things well with this you can now actually perform that entire song and my skepticism in it was that this would be more aggressive than this or this would bring a noise floor and this would you know all those things that we were taught to avoid in standard audio recording 24-bit you know, 48, even maybe even 192, 24-bit. But in 24-bit recording, we were trained to, you know, just make sure everything was dynamically accurate, no clipping, no, you weren't low, so you had to bring up noise, all that stuff. So now you just do it in that one average. And then again, as long as you're not physically distorting the capsule, which would basically take a jet engine uh, constant on, <laughs> you know, to do so, you're going to be fine. And then each stage of it is recorded. Um, properly. So let me actually show that in that presentation that you were talking about. So yeah, I just want to say one thing. Just, oh, just, some mm -hmm. folks may not know um, everything that what what, um, what you just said, but essentially, what you said, you know, if you turn the input volume up of your microphone, at some point it reaches this threshold where it's like I can't have any more. That's as high as I go, and then when you reach that threshold, that's clipping or distortion. So if I turn the input gain up on my voice here, it would eventually just start distorting. Another now, if I spoke very quietly and we had to turn the input gain up, all that room tone, the, the sort of natural sound also goes up. So that's the noise floor he's talking about. So it's like having that balance is is you know what you'd have to do. And uh that's that can be really tricky. That's all that stuff of like you gotta set the levels right, all those things. One hundred percent. And that that kind of comes in this uh we talk about especially originally, you know, in audio before 32 bit float or alongside 32 bit float, you are talking about a headroom an overall width, if a uh, height uh, of level that you're capable of doing inside of your gear, right? So you get up to the top of that in literally with your preamp going into over uh, uh, like a Rodecaster Pro or something like that. Well, once you get to the top of that digital threshold, 
you're done. You're going to distort. It literally physically takes a waveform, sorry, waveform and squares it off. And that is, although distortion exists in, say, guitars or things like that where they're musically pleasant, in, in dialogue or in like a microphone and digital conversion, it just chops it off and it's not musical at all. It's not designed to sound good. It uh, is literally incorrect gain staging. And so the bottom side of that is actually where all that psh, hiss and noise lives. And so if you record too quiet on that preamp, so your levels are just kind of getting in that low uh, range of input, well, then you're going to have to turn it up eventually. And then what's going to come up with that is all noise floor. So every bit of circuitry has an, an, an uh, its own noise floor. So in our microphones, Rode has always been very proud at uh, like the NT1A, the NT1 original. Uh, I can't speak on the NT1 original, but the NT1A uh, was, was 5 dB, 5, uh, 6 dBA. Uh, and, uh, and then in this, you got, you got 4 dBA. So that's why I show it over here actually in 4. Now, um, you know, U87 from Neumann, that's 6 dBA. And then all the Rode microphones um, since the NT1A have been inside of that range of, you know, 5 to 4. <laughs> I think it was like 5, 4.5, 4, and 4. And so they're all very quiet. You're not going to hear a difference between those, but it has an essential noise. And, and that, uh, that bass noise floor can be brought up through a preamp if you, if you incorrectly record them. Well, with 32-bit float, it actually looks more like this. So I'll switch over to this slide. And what you're actually trying to do here is take that capsule and then you have four stages inside of the NT1 fifth gen. Most of uh, the companies out there doing 32-bit float that I've heard of, I'm sure somebody can correct me on that, are doing uh, two, uh, two interfaces and so forth. So think of this like a, an audio interface inside of the NT1 fifth generation. And so you have a preamplifier stage. And then that goes into the A to D converters and then inside of that processing that will create a 32-bit data stream. And when you're doing that four times over, you're taking that headroom we showed in the previous slide and recording it properly at this level, recording it properly at this level, recording it properly at this, and then finally the fourth. So the more you can shove in there, the better it's going to be also. But you're, you're targeting those zones of the entire capability of the microphone and recording them properly. And then when you add a low noise circuit, like our revolution preamps and things like that, you're going to get a low noise output across all four stages of those as well, allowing you to properly record. So when people say, well, you're fixing in post, it's just the same thing as fixing in post. Technically, it's not. It's, it's now adjusting in post because you're recording it properly at four different, at four different stages and allowing you to manipulate it later instead of correct it later. Okay. So <laughs> just for those folks who back home, uh, back home. are, are um, maybe some of this is a little, um, you know, less tech savvy. So you always want to make things accessible. So the A to D conversion we talk about, audio to do. So it, has, it comes from the audio that is my voice into this microphone and then into this computer or across the internet. It's audio, you know, uh, from a waveform to uh, a digital thing. And then it comes out as audio again. Um, so that's that's the the conversion part. And what he's talking about is the actual microphone itself. So if um, you had a 32-bit recording program, Hindenburg is one of those, uh, which is very, very cool. As great as that is, if you recorded something with a microphone that didn't have the capability of that, it would still reach that that uh, threshold, that floor. Um, so you would, you would, the waves would come in and it's like, oh, it's too much. Like, like the jet engine, just too loud. All you're going to hear is basically noise. But if the microphone can, has this capability, you can, you, you won't clip the microphone. And then that sound, which is insanely loud, you can have completely cleanly in from the microphone and into the DAW. 100%. Just anything. It's pretty, it's like magic. 100 <laughs> percent, and it is magic and that's where the magic really lives in that uh both the fact that we can get circuitry small enough to actually place this into something just the size of a microphone um wireless or studio or otherwise and then add all these conversions but uh just to add to what you're saying there i like to kind of divide this up into three categories to try to simplify just in in layman's terms what what she, what each stage is you know the microphone everybody knows that's what you talk into it's going to capture your voice and we just know it does that and that's how it does it we don't need to get deeper into that 
Well, the preamp is just a gain stage. It's just a volume knob. Okay. So if you were physically running a roadcaster or a audio interface, well, you would have a knob on it and you turn that up. I like to just relate it to the television. Everybody's used it. Everybody knows it. You're going to turn up the TV, turn down the TV. Well, that's where the preamps come into, uh, the conversation. It's, it's pulling that level up, recording it at a certain, or not even recording it yet. Sorry. Uh, just bringing it in at, at the right gain at the right volume. And then when you get into the A to D conversion of it, all that is analog to digital. And so we have a digital world these days. We're taking analog, which is all voltages and converting them to something a computer can understand. So most people think of this to like a USB hub or some kind of uh, digital device. You know, we use those all the time. So it's just taking the stuff that was already voltages and making it something a computer can understand. Don't worry about the algorithm when you're thinking basically. All you need to know with the algorithm is that it's communicating with softwares like Hindenburg to where it can then be decoded. And again, you're not going to even touch that. You're going to get into Hindenburg and auto gain that sucker, and it's going to be right there. <laughs> so there is this happy marriage, uh, which I'm just going to show uh, the idea of it here uh, real quickly in a Hindenburg session. Um, so here we are in Hindenburg. Uh, you see my screen, Ryan? I can, yes, sir. All right, great. So here's a Hindenburg session. Uh, and yes, this is Pro 2. Uh, and oh, yes, it will be available soon. Uh, we promise, promise, promise for those folks who are curious about that. But so here we have it. Just uh, I'm sure many of you folks are already familiar with Hindenburg, but you know, if I have this 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 region he here, he walks past the roads of machinery. Okay. Uh, if I you know recorded it and it was um, coming in right as you uh, you know we have the auto level feature which says hey uh, that audio is recorded too loud. But even if I recorded some audio like like I'll just record myself on this track uh, here. Okay. So there I am speaking, and there it is. And now if I turned up my input in there, you saw it raise my voice up a little bit, right? If I um, turn this my input gain all the way up, it would still turn it down, but it would be distorted because it was just it's just too much input going in there. But with 32-bit float, you uh, you really can't distort it. So you could scream into the microphone, turn the input gain essentially all the way up, and because that auto level feature is there, amazingly, it actually just brings it down. And it sounds normal. It sounds fine. It's incredible. And one thing uh, that uh, with this, um, there's a, a feature in Pro 2 that um, is pretty cool. If you go into properties, um, each region that you have here, you have a gain. So you could completely uh, blow this out if you wanted to, adding 40 dB of gain. Um, I won't play that because it'll sound bad. Uh, but you can do endless manipulation, especially with 32-bit float. You kind of have like this massive range that you can work with and do things with so super super cool especially with the um auto level feature which is kind of like a happy marriage here it really is it's one of the things where uh that's <laughs> i mean we both just like looked at each other and kind of went yeah <laughs> you know like it was just it was it was exactly what we needed but because of those i i'm gonna keep stressing it because of those four levels being recorded properly if you have a software as you do that is going to allow it to pull it to a proper gain stage with a previous uh, recording of proper gain staging and allowing you to basically pull it up, pull it down, that, that TV remote up and down. Uh, it's clean no matter where you go. So again, it, it can be up at that, that loudness that you want it to, and then basically you're going to distort your speakers. You know, If you turn it up by that 40 dB, well, the input wasn't distorted. You just turned it up so loud that later it, you know, it's the same thing as turning your TV up too loud. Uh, the speakers are eventually going to go, <laughs> you know, and not have a good time with it. But you could also equally just whisper into that recording and either auto gain it to something you need it. Or I'm sure that you have, you know, your processes as well to set, you know, well, maybe I don't want this one to auto. I just want it to be quiet. And well, there you go. You just turn it down in, into that stage. And that's now going to be quieter than the other parts. And that allows you to also do dynamics inside of that. But if you're doing something like an audio book or you're doing something uh, like we talked about with voiceovers where you want consistency, auto is going to do that without making it noisy or distorted. Right. Just uh, amazing. So why don't you have, you have a, a little uh, presentation, right? Um, uh, 
we've kind of touched on some of it. <laughs> and okay. so the rest is basically just the NT1 fifth gen. Um, and so those, those two slides are my key things. If you'd be okay with it. Uh, well, I do have some demonstration videos if you want to do those. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So why don't you share your screen for those folks watching at home? Um, it, because we're doing this over, uh, with a browser, it probably makes sense to put it in full screen so you can see everything. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to just share the screen first here. Okay, we got our aim here, right? And then I'm going to go full screen. Oh, it kicked me back over to the... Again. Yeah, all right, we good? We're good. Here we go. 32-bit float audio processing is nothing new. Whilst a lot of people are talking about it right now, the DAW you use for recording and editing has been using 32-bit float audio processing for years. At its simplest, 32-bit float allows for a much wider range of audio levels than regular 16 or 24-bit audio. And that's why it's important inside a DAW. When you are adding processing, adjusting levels, and mixing lots of sources together, you need additional headroom to ensure you don't lose any of the audio information. It represents all of the original audio, so you have full flexibility to adjust levels in post-production. For close to 100 years, audio engineers have been reaching for the gain knob. That's right, the humble gain knob has been the gateway to high-quality recording pretty much since microphones were invented. It's the first control on a console channel strip and the first thing you need to set in a recording workflow. What that gain knob does is match the sensitivity of the recording system to the volume of the sound being recorded. You can think of it as a sliding window, where the window is the range of audio levels you can successfully record. Record too close to the bottom of the window and your recording will be noisy. Record too near the top of the window and your recording will distort and sound harsh. You slide the window around using the gain knob so it matches the level of audio that you are recording. For quiet sounds, you slide the window down by turning up the gain, so your levels are in that area of high quality recording. For loud sounds, you do the opposite to ensure there's no distortion or clipping. But what if I told you you didn't have to set the gain anymore? This is what 32-bit float recording does. It uses a clever technique at the preamp stage that stacks multiple digital converters on top of each other and then combines their output into a 32-bit float bitstream. So, once you have made your recording in 32-bit float, what do you do? Because you've captured all of the information from the microphone capsule, you can then effectively alter the gain of your recording after you've made it. Again, think of the sliding window analogy. After you've made your recording, you can open it in your DAW, and slide the window to get optimal audio levels simply by turning the gain up or down. Things sound a bit quiet, slide the window down to get a good level. Things are too loud and sound distorted, slide the window up and the distortion will go away as the window now matches the louder levels. And if your audio recording has some sections that are very quiet and some sections that are very loud, you can adjust the gain of each section independently to optimize your recording. However, it's this aspect of 32-bit float recording that seems to confuse some people. Audio engineers have been setting the gain at the start of recording sessions for a very long time, and I think some of them struggle with the concept that 32-bit float recording has literally made the gain knob obsolete. Totally. So that's the, that is the idea in a nutshell. Um, and we have a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Chris asked a question here. I'm going to show on the stage. And I feel like uh, the video did touch on some of this. Um, but can you explain the float part of 32-bit float? Ooh, I love it. Um, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Chris, that is a great question. And, and so uh, the way that... I highly recommend everybody go read the research that is uh, that has gone into both integer recording 
and float recording. It is a mathematical equation. So when we talk about integer, that's basically what we've been in. 16 integer, 16 bit integer. Uh, let's see where, I mean, eight bit integer, um, right? And then so 16, uh, 44, one, Wait, I'm going bit and sample rate, sorry. So uh, 24 bit integer. Well, then there's also 32 bit float and 32 bit integer. In the float, that is where I start to lose it from a standpoint of uh, algorithm. But the way the math is supposedly working out there is that it's an exponential factor now in the ones and zeros that are actually being um, combined in the algorithm and so with integer you didn't have it actually mathematically um going to this the height in which a, a um, an exponential uh mathematical equation could do to it so the float is actually allowing you to uh, mathematically exponentially create more headroom into it uh anything you want to add to that jonathan while i look something up that actually uh i can share with everybody that Just actually shows that math well, I would say just maybe I I work well with uh, a visual. So maybe something like um, they have a raft on on water. If the raft was stationary and the water raised, the water would go above the raft. But the raft isn't stationary. The raft floats. And so as the water rises, the raft also rises. Maybe that helps with thinking about it, that essentially because of the float mechanic, you it doesn't matter in which register you're you're recording the audio because you can't you can't possibly clip it. Um, so it, it essentially catches the full range of uh, dynamics. Uh, but maybe we should move on to because Deborah has another question. Yeah, let's do that. And I actually have uh, something from our friends at Sound Devices that I uh, well, if you don't mind, let me share this real fast, and I'll just send people over there. It's a great read. Highly recommend it. Um, Thirty-two bit. Yeah, I believe this is it. Uh, you see our friends over at Sound Devices? So Sound Devices has been doing 32-bit float uh, recorders, right? So our Rodecaster Pro 2 is not yet 32-bit float. I can't answer whether that will be a thing or not in the future. I hope so. Uh, who wouldn't want you know the extra depth? But this entire article here, so Sound Devices, all you need to do is actually just do 32-bit float Sound Devices or 32-bit float explained Sound Devices, and you get this. And it will literally walk you through the equations that are pulling, see, these are what I'm talking about right here, right? <laughs> so while I'm I'm able to kind of understand the concept of what it's doing there, as you go up, oh, and being forward, yeah, that's... <laughs> it gets into straight up mathematical equations that are well outside of my uh, education level. But it's, it's very fun to read when you're a nerd like myself, but you can see fixed point, that's what's integer, right? And you're just looking at the mathematical uh, equation. Eventually, they get to the point of this will have 770 dBFS in both sides of the positive and negative spectrum. And so if you're interested in that, Chris, I highly recommend you go check that out. And again, uh, I'll share my email at the end. You can feel free to talk to me more about that in the future as well. It gets really deep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, the interface um, may not have 32-bit flow, but you were talking about a microphone, and uh, that is the question that Deborah has. Which Rode mics currently offer this technology? A great question, Deborah. Currently, we have the Rode NT1 fifth generation in silver and black, and those are the two. I would love to see everything be expanded upon on that. 32-bit uh, float, and I, again, cannot necessarily directly answer this for uh, Rode Australia, but uh, the wireless microphone space is heavy in 32-bit float, and I would love to see our wireless go-tos get to that point. We did allow conversion inside of our software to do to get you an output that was 32-bit float, but when it's not recorded in 32-bit float, it's not truly 32-bit float. You can't save it after the fact, right? So um, I'd love to see it in the wireless go-tos. I'd love to see it in our uh, pod mic. We just released a USB version of the pod mic. I would love to see it in that someday. And then, of course, the roadcasters uh, can't go wrong with 32-bit float in any kind of interface, the AI1 or otherwise. So to answer your question, the NT1 fifth generation is the only product right now with 32-bit float tech. Okay. So we got another Chris who's stalking us. Uh, will Road have a stand at the London podcast show? Uh, will we be seeing you in London? I don't know. So we are a worldwide company and I am a representative for the US office. We have our distribution here and uh, the UK has their own distribution as well. So um, uh, London 
uh, I'm going to vacation in London, but I won't be there for road. <laughs> you know, uh, if road is watching. I'd love to go and teach over in London as well. But uh, to London road. Oh, uh, no, I don't. I don't know. Unfortunately, if we will be hanging out there. OK. All right. Uh, well, let's well, let's hope it, it does happen. All right. So Chris has another question. Um, uh, different Chris. Um, can you say something about field recording with 32 bit float, even if Rode might not have a device for that? Yeah. I am going to say that I'm with Jonathan on this, that I was a uh, skeptic early on and not, not like I was, I would never use it. Right. It's, it's like 360 audio. Or, why? What's the, yeah, point? yeah. It's, it's like surround sound. It's something, it's something new that you will have to focus on in your day to day, um, setup. Right. But let's talk about our friends at sound devices. Right. So road does not have a portable recorder yet. Again, can't answer whether they'll do that or not. Anything we have would be amazing. I would love to see us, uh, do a 32 bit recorder, uh, a portable recorder, I should say, but, when you have that access to a 32-bit float recording, especially in field recording, you you will just instantly be recording at full fidelity at the lowest noise floor humanly possible in today's technology. There is zero reason to not turn it on. If you have to go to a DAW and you have to carry your computer and a 32-bit float interface and uh, this microphone that might be USB that does it, I'm just listing basically our products like. Hindenburg and the NT one fifth. Um, if you have a microphone that goes 32 bit float into, sorry, if you have a microphone that goes into a recorder, that's 32 bit float. And then you can take that into Hindenburg when you get back home, do it hands down every time. It's an amazing thing. You could, you could record a bus going by that would normally completely distort your signal and somebody just speaking right next to you. And you'll hear both of them perfectly clearly and can control the levels perfectly clearly. So, so to that, this, this might be a good moment where we can, are we, uh, a hard stop at three o'clock? Well, we're going to, yeah, we're, we're say what you want to say. The people are I'm, here. I'm central time. So that'd be three o'clock central time. <laughs> U.S. Um, I, I have a video that demonstrates this and, and it really does a good job of showing like that bus and that whisper, uh, it, cause he literally does a whisper and then he literally like yells into the microphone right to where it's distorted and clipped and then he saves that he he brings that back to um clean gain all, all i want to say with that especially with field recorder and to your point jonathan is that when you just have one recording in field recording especially you don't know what's coming in you don't know what's going out so you need the ability to kind of save that later with clean gain so would you like me to demonstrate that or uh, yeah. does that answer that question no, no i'm turning off my my uh camera because i want to i want uh i don't want to distract i want to see the video Okay, let's do it. Okay, so I need to uh, run my PowerPoint over to that video. I'm going to share my screen with audio. All right, we're seeing it. We're seeing yeah. it, and everybody again, just full okay. screen. Be, uh, you can see it clearer. There is a shortcut. I should have. I don't want it to go back to the. Uh, the first slide um is it f3 or f i know this one's f5 yeah let's just do this slow way i'll hold everybody up here here we go in this video i'll be looking at the practical applications of 32-bit float and showing a full walkthrough of the 32-bit float recording workflow to demonstrate 32-bit float recording I'm using the NT1 fifth generation microphone. This microphone has an exceptionally low noise floor of just 4 dBA, and this is the quietest studio condenser microphone in the world, and means it excels at capturing very quiet sounds. It also boasts a high SPL handling of 132 dB, so it's able to handle the very loudest sources. With its wide frequency response and warm, detailed sound, it is a fantastic microphone for all types of recording. Now, to do this demonstration, we've come here to Studio 301 in Sydney. This is the premier recording studio in Australia and ranks among the top 10 recording studios in the world. Now, the reason we've come here to their famous Studio One recording room is because to demonstrate this microphone and the quality you can achieve, we need to be somewhere very quiet. 
and this room has a noise floor of just 20 dBA. Now to do this demonstration, I'm going to record something that's very quiet, followed by something very loud. So first of all, I'm going to whisper into this microphone, and then I'm going to shout. Now, let's do that. So I've clicked record, and now I'm recording the 32-bit float output from this microphone. And you can see on my DAW screen, the audio recording is proceeding. So the levels actually look quite good at the moment for me speaking in my normal voice at this kind of distance to the microphone. But what happens if I start to whisper? So now I'm speaking very, very quietly into this microphone and listening to the sound in the room. What I can actually hear is a slight whir, which is coming, or buzz, which is coming from the camera that we're using to record this video. And in this very, very quiet studio, it, it's amazingly, I can actually hear that. So that's something very quiet. Let's try something a bit louder. So now I'm talking very loudly. In fact, I'm shouting into this microphone and looking at my DAW, I can see my audio is clipping terribly. Um, things are really not looking very good at all. So let's stop our recording and see what we've captured. Now you can see the first section of the recording uh, where I was speaking normally kind of looks fine. But then there's a section um, where I was whispering and the level is much too low. And you can see the section at the end where I was shouting as clipped horribly as it was very loud. But what I'm gonna do is just take that section where I was whispering and do a simple normalization to raise the level. So let's do that. And as you can see, the level on that audio has now been brought up and we can see the waveform quite clearly. Let's have a listen to how that sounds. So now I'm speaking very, very quietly into this microphone and listening to the sound in the room. What I can actually hear is a slight whir, which is coming, or buzz, which is coming from the camera that we're using to record this video. And in this very, very quiet studio, it, it's amazingly, I can actually hear that. Now, let's have a look at this second section where I was shouting, which looks like a bit of a disaster. Um, my audio is quite clipped, but with 32-bit float, of course, I can adjust the gain in post-production. So let's normalize that part of the clip to bring down the gain. So now I'm talking very loudly. In fact, I'm shouting into this microphone and looking at my DAW, I can see my audio is clipping terribly. Um, things are really not looking very good at all. So just as a reminder, both those two clips were recorded into the same microphone with no adjustment to the recording levels or the gain. I just plugged the microphone into the computer and hit record. And we could record a very quiet sound and a very loud one without having to change any of the settings while still getting an optimal result. That is oh, so man. cool. And I should say... <laughs> Sorry to for, anyone who's wearing headphones. <laughs> there's, a, you know, again, I just can't uh, stress this enough. In Hindenburg, the added benefit of that clipped and distorted section that he did where he was yelling remember we have the auto leveler i mean it'll just bring it down and it's just it's it's like magic you can just automatically have things where you could shout and whisper and it's it's an incredible thing so uh, we talked to a lot to people that do voiceovers for anything yeah. and uh, i won't even say just voiceover like voice talent in general video games uh audiobooks and things like that along with hindenburg where right. you don't have to then take the time to go back so if if 32-bit float was to have a couple downsides there are some algorithm things that can cause maybe some uh, what are called snits and snats in the industry you just clicks here and there very small very uh un not frequent and things like that it, it has to do with your processing speed in your computer and things like that too but uh you have to go back in and then adjust those again now I think most of us would agree if you have experience in the industry that it's worse to have to go back and re-record <laughs> than to simply just normalize or adjust some gain. But with Hindenburg, you don't have to do that. So having that in the toolkit as well to auto do it for you to the thresholds you would like, I mean, amazing. Yeah. 
the, a phrase we're, um, we're saying a lot these days is time to market. It's all just like, how fast can you get this done without, you know, having to, you know, uh, and it's just irritating having to kind of set, I mean, again, imagine in a voiceover context, scream right. one line, whisper the next line. You have to go back and do that. You do a hundred lines. It's kind of a, kind of a pain, but. Right. No and more. then you do have to adjust those gains uh, again. So we showed that. I think that was Reaper because it's uh, uh, it's not necessarily pay to play and things like that. But any DAW or, or otherwise, you're going to have to know that post-production editing is a thing with Hindenburg, not a thing. So um, I just took to that right away, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems like a, a wonderful place to leave it. Um, Ron, really thanks everybody uh, out there watching in the Facebook uh, community on those streams and on our YouTube channel. And of course, all the folks in uh, here in Airmeet. Um, Jonathan, just if you don't mind me interrupting, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Deborah just asked a real quick question here uh, on the Q&A. That oh, is sure. extraordinary. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate it. So in just about any recording scenario, you'd be better upgrading to 32-bit float enabled microphones. Yes. And that also can go to that question about the field recording as well if you have the chance to do 32-bit float. Now, one thing I'll just drive home is it's not magic. Although it seems magic in the gain staging side of things, you notice also when we whisper into that microphone, you get things like lip smacks and breaths, and you're going to be pulling up the sounds that that microphone recorded. So um, keep that in mind as well. You'll want a decent room. You'll want to make sure that uh, proximity and, and, and vibe of the sound overall is going to be good. But yes, if you can have 32-bit float, I would do it. Yeah. Make make your life easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's about it's about redundancy and backup. It's gonna cover your uh your problems if you possibly have them. All right, everybody. Really appreciate it. Hope you got uh got a lot out of this and we will see you at the next one. We'll see you down the road. Thank you, Jim. down the road. Come on. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs>